Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pindika's Park. Then a Brahmin student, Sabha, Todiya's son, went to the Blessed One, exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause and condition, Master Gotama, why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? Student beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which he spoke of in which he spoke in brief without expounding the meaning in detail. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma so I might understand it in detail, the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. Now, he was a smart little guy because the, the Buddha would come out and say, Oh, monks, what are you talking about? And they would tell him, and then he would give them a Dhamma talk in brief, and he'd hesitate for a minute, and then he would get up and leave. And then the monks went, I wonder what that meant. <laughs> so they would go to another monk that was well-versed, and they would ask him the meaning. And then they would get scolded, or not asking from the Buddha himself when he was there and available, and then he would give them the Dhamma talk, and then he told them to go to the Buddha after he gave the talk to see whether it was correct or not. Of course, it was always correct. But <coughs> if they had thought to ask the Buddha then, then he would have stayed and he would, give, he would have given the talk in detail. Some of the some of the talks that the Buddha gave would last for long periods of time. He might start in the evening and the talk would last all night. And he had enough repeating and all of that sort of thing that that, that the monks would really understand what he was saying by the time he was done. Then, student, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. The Brahmin student Sabha replied, the Blessed One said this, Here, student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action on dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, even in hell. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, but instead comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. 
This is the way, student, that leads to short life. Namely, one kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows, violence, and merciless to living beings. But here, student, some man or woman, abandoning the killing of living beings, abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a happy destination in a heavenly world, but instead comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he has a long life. That is the way, student, that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings. One abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapons laid aside. Gentle and kindly, one abides compassionate to all living beings. Here, student, some man or woman is given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is sickly. This is the way, student, that leads to sickliness, namely, one is given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. But here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring living beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is the way, student, that leads to health. Namely, one is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. Here, student, some man or woman is of an angry and irritable character. Even when criticized a little, he is offended, becomes angry, hostile, resentful, displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if he, but it, if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is ugly. That is the way, student, that leads to ugliness. Namely, one is of an angry, irritable character and displays a lot of anger, hate, and bitterness. In Asia, if you see an Asian getting angry, their face actually turns black. And they, their faces, amazingly, it, it turns really ugly. You don't see that so much here, but you, you start to look at uh, what it's like, especially for women, if they get angry. They go from being a beautiful young girl to a very ugly young girl because of the anger that they have. And when they start changing that into their habit, that starts changing their looks. And they are not pleasing to look at. 
But here, students, a man or woman is not an angry or irritable character. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended. Does not become angry, hostile, resentful, and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination, but if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is beautiful. This is the way, student, that leads to being beautiful, namely one is not an angry or irritable character and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Here, student, some man or woman is envious, who envies, resents, begrudges the, the gains, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation, but if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is uninfluential. This is the way, student, that leads to being uninfluential. Namely, one is envious towards the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. <coughs> But here, student, some man or woman is not envious. One does not, one who does not envy, resent, begrudge the gain, honors, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is influential. This is a way, student, that leads to being influential. Namely, one is not envious towards the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Here, student, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwelling, and lamps to recluses or brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation, but if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is poor. This is the way, student. That leads to poverty. Namely, one does not give food and lamps to recluses and brahmins. David and I had a teacher who came from India. We were both at the same place. And we would sit down to eat, and he was always taking food off his plate and putting it on other people's plates all around him. He was always sharing his food. And it was real inspiring to be around him because he was always sharing things. And he was more than happy to do that. And he shared Dhamma a lot. He'd give, start giving talks, and he would talk for three hours, sometimes a little longer. But the thing is, I mean, this is one way of sharing so that you'll be prosperous. But there are a lot of other ways of sharing that help you to be prosperous when you're smiling and you give your smile away, you're being generous. When you use words that are kind to other people and make them feel good and you appreciate them and that makes them feel good, that's being generous. 
practicing your generosity. It's not only material things that you can practice your generosity with. When you think of different individuals, you have thoughts of them, and you start radiating loving kindness to them, you're giving them a gift. Whether they, they realize it or not doesn't matter. So it's a real interesting thing to practice your generosity as much as you can. And that way you will always have abundance. You'll always have prosperity. And prosperity comes in all kinds of different ways. So it turns into a kind of protection for you as you practice giving not only material things but of your energy that always comes back to you in positive ways. I mean, I just traveled around the world I don't have any money, but people donated money to have me come here or there. It was quite an interesting trip. A little bit long for my taste. I don't think I'm ever going to do that again. But we'll see. <coughs> <coughs> But the more you can practice your generosity in giving things away, the more uplifted your mind becomes. The lighter your mind becomes, the easier it is to recognize when your mind starts to get heavy. So it helps your mindfulness very much. To have a very light mind means to have a mind that doesn't want to control and make things be the way you want them to be. It means that you have a mind that opens up and allows things to be there and you, you can observe much more easily with a light mind. And having a light mind with a sense of fun is a very desirable kind of existence. When I first went to Malaysia, they asked me to help them build a meditation center and a monastery. And all of the people that came, they, they put out a lot of effort and a lot of energy and they really tried hard, but they were all sour. They had sour faces. They couldn't smile. They had the idea that the only way to be successful in life was to be serious. And these, these were mostly Chinese. They're very ambitious folks, and they're, they're quite good at business. But they, they, didn't, they didn't back off very well for their meditation. As a result, their meditation progress is, was very slow. And even to this day, they're practicing meditation, and they've been doing it for years. And they still have not gotten the idea that you have to have a light mind. You go into where they're practicing, they do a retreat, and it's like walking into a very heavy mud. Because it's just, it's hard to move around because their minds are so serious and they're trying so hard 
that they're developing a concentration that is not appropriate for the meditation. And they haven't learned over the years that their mind is supposed to be light. As a result, when I was away from Malaysia for 15 years, I came back and they're still in the same spot they were when I left. They haven't really learned a lot. So the whole point of practicing your generosity, especially with material things, but in all ways, is that it helps your mind become lighter and you don't get so attached to things and you don't become so upset so easily. So it's a real interesting phenomena when you see people that are quote, practicing Buddhism, but they haven't really learned what the Buddha was talking about. And the Buddha was most interested in having everyone have an uplifted mind, have a wholesome mind, a mind that didn't have any craving in it. During the time of the Buddha, there was 60 million people that became Buddhists. And that was before radio and television. Now, that must mean that he had something to give that they really agreed with. And uh, the, the monks at that time, because they had him as their teacher, they were smiling and happy most of the time. And they were very good examples of what the Buddhist teaching really is all about. Your meditation is three parts. This is the definition of meditation. Practicing your generosity, keeping your precepts without breaking them. <clears throat> And then having quiet time so you can do some meditation. Now, people that follow this, their, uh, their progress in the meditation is really fast. Doesn't take long at all for them to understand because they don't have a lot of hindrances coming up in their mind. They don't have a lot of problems from breaking precepts and feeling guilty. So, as a result, their mind becomes very peaceful and very calm very quickly. And that is directly from following the whole path of meditation, not just sitting in meditation. I think that's a mistake that's happening in this country. Because people want to learn how to meditate, but they don't want to learn how to let go of things. I want to attain Nibbana, but I want to stay the way I am. Well, that doesn't work very well. It's not what you would call immediately effective practice. So it's a needed thing to let people know that when you're practicing meditation, you have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to let go of your old attachments, your opinions, your ideas, and develop a mind that's more open and accepting and clear. And when you get off retreat, that doesn't mean you stop meditating. You can carry this meditation with you all the time. And it's actually preferable to carry it with you all the time. 
So it's really a nice kind of practice because it leads you more and more to a mind that's uplifted. And with an uplifted mind, you have a tendency to pull people that are very positive, that are fun to be around. You have those kind of friends coming to you because that's the way you are. But you have to be willing to let go of your old ways of thinking and acting and develop new ways that are inspiring, not only to you, but to everyone else around you. So this practicing of generosity is, is a real important aspect. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wealthy. That is the way, student, that leads to wealth. Namely, one gives food and requisites to recluses and monks. Here, student, some man or woman is obstinate, arrogant, does not pay homage to those who, who should receive homage, does not rise up for one in whose presence he should rise up, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one for whom he should make way, and does not honor, respect, revere, venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if he comes back in the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is low-born. One of the things that causes low birth is continual cursing using foul language. When you get around people that are more educated, the foul language disappears. You don't hear it so much. But when I went, I went to Asia, I came back 12 years later, I was completely shocked at how coarse everybody's language was. They, on, on radio, they were talking about all kinds of things that they never would have said that when I was growing up. But they're, they're talking about it on the radio and they think it's cute. But they're showing off how low-born they really are, how coarse their personality is. So it's learning how to let go of that. And that leads to a mind that is much more uplifted. Almost everybody that curses, they have an awful lot of anger inside them. And they won't let go of that anger. They like being able to use that kind of language. And that's kind of a shame. But it does get in the way of your meditation. Because of the anger, you're not willing to change. You're not willing to clean up your speech so you can clean up your mind. That's just another way of showing immaturity even though they can be in their 70s and 80s. They're still being immature by using foul language like that. <coughs> this is a way, student, that leads to low birth, namely one is obstinate and arrogant, does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. 
But here, student, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should be he should receive homage. Rises up for one in whose presence he should rise up. Offers a seat to one who deserves a seat. Makes way for one whom he should make way. Honors, respects, venerates, and gent and reveres one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination, but if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is highborn. This is the way, student, that leads to high birth. Namely, one is not obstinate and arrogant and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respect, respected, revered, and venerated. Here, student, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or a Brahmin and ask, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. Not asking questions will tend to make you not as smart as you could be. And I've told this story a lot of times, but I took care of Venerable Usilananda, who was a very, very educated monk. I mean, he, he memorized this many books and took tests on it, and he was number one in the country, not making a mistake. And that's, that's a very difficult test. And when he came to America, I started being his attendant. And I asked him if I could be his attendant because I had a lot of questions about Buddhism. I had a lot of questions about how things work. So I was asking him questions all the time. And I, was, it was, I stayed with him for about two years. And finally, he got so tired of hearing me ask, can I ask you a question? He said, you know, if you don't attain Nibbana in this lifetime, you're going to be reborn a human being, and you're going to be the smartest person in the whole world just because of all the questions you keep asking over and over and over, and I wanted to know the little tiny nuances and things like that. And the way karma works, guess what kind of students I have? Especially Sister Kema. She comes to me Oh, not so much anymore. It's only five or six times a day. And it says, can I ask you a question? She's still like that. And of course, there's no such a thing as a stupid question. Unless you already know the answer and you're just trying to test. If you already know the answer, I don't need to answer that. So, but here, monk, some man or woman, visits a recluse or Brahmin and <coughs> asks, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? 
because of performing excuse me of performing and undertaking such action he reappears in a happy destination but if instead he comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn, he is wise. This is a way, student, that leads to wisdom, namely one visits a recluse or Brahman and asks such questions. Thus, student, the way that leads to short life makes people live short. The way that leads to long life makes people live long. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to being uninfluential makes people uninfluential. The way that leads beings to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to wisdom makes people wise. Beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as being inferior and superior. When this was said, the Brahmin student Sabha Todiya's son said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been turned overturned revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. And generally, when you hear that kind of statement at the end of a sutta, it means that that person had become a sotapanna. So it's, it's a nice little thing. No. No. You, they, they experience Nibbana because it, it clicks in them some of the things that were stopping them from going deeper. It, it, it improved their understanding. Like Sariputta, I mean, <clears throat> all he had to do was hear one thing about dependent origination, and he he understood it, mm -hmm. and that he became a sotapanna because of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily from becoming a um, a meditator that you can get up to fairly high stages. It is through your understanding. Mm -hmm. I had one student that they spent an awful lot of time looking at and studying dependent origination. Mm -hmm. 
And the way they were looking at it was from the big picture. And when I came and I, I gave them a talk on dependent origination as being very subtle, very small, and telling them that it could be big or it could be small, depending on your your uh, perspective. They got it. They just needed that little bit of understanding and then they became sort of on it. It can happen. There's some people, uh, some monks in, uh, in Burma that their confidence is so strong that they talk to people about keeping their precepts and then after that they give the precepts to them and people become sotapanas right then. It can happen. Of course, there's a lot of other people that look at that and go, yeah, 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 I, I, I don't believe that. So, so are they getting four noble truths or dependent origination or are they just getting it through? Understanding. Understanding the benefits of uh, precepts. Yeah. Towards uh, Nibbana. Right. How, how they do purify you. The purification through all yeah. that. Uh, yeah. And uh, the understanding that Subha got from just getting straightened out that made his mind very peaceful and calm and he had this relief that happened mm -hmm. because now he understood how this all works. Mm -hmm. And there is there's a lot of, you see monks that from other sects that come and they talk to the Buddha and just during the first time they ever heard him give a talk, they become arahats. Well, they, they had done a lot of work. They'd done a lot of meditation. They were able to really understand what the Buddha was saying. And mostly what he was saying was use right effort. Have that relaxed step in there. And that's, that's just the one piece that was missing. So there, there are different ways, and and what is it, uh, Kitagiri Sutta? It, it discusses different ways of attaining nibbana, and they they one of the lower kinds of sotapanna is called a, a faith follower. And their faith is so strong that the Buddha was an enlightened being that all they do is hear what the Buddha said and they they become sotapanna. Mm. And then there's a Dhamma follower and they're the ones that started doing a little bit of meditation and, and they heard some of the... Uh, some of the discourses and they became uh, sotapanna. But the only way you can get to the higher stages, and that's anagami and, and arahatship, is through development of your understanding through direct experience. It is a direct experience that is so valuable so that you can go deeper. And that's why I, I was, you know, you were talking about Brenda asking, oh, where does it say this? Well, you don't get to these deep states of, of understanding by just surface knowledge. It has to be direct experience and you see for yourself this is exactly how the links of dependent origination work.
So. And so that way, through all that, those higher states, they're there through what, the, um, according to the um, realm of the higher type meditation, the expanded type, the, the radiated type, live. And mm -hmm. not the one pointed that sometimes crops up in the right. sun. How's that? Um, I think that Pali word, ekagaha. Yeah. How did that word come in? And is that a poor translation? Yeah, of that word? Yeah. <laughs> they they try to take and and break words up. Yes. Okay. And ika means one. Yes. But the actual word is. It comes from the base ikaga, mm -hmm. which stands for tranquil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, and that's and that's the meaning of that. Oh but it, it has been poorly translated. And Usil Ananda wrote a book on the Satipatthana Sutta, and he had five or six different definitions of ikagata, oh. and none of them really fit very well. Mm. And when he got to the instructions in the meditation, mm. where it says that on the in breath you tranquilize your bodily formation, on the out breath you tranquilize your bodily formation. Well, he just kind of lightly skipped over that part. That Ikagata has really become the established view. Yes. It's, um, it has, and it's just like the word jhana. I mean, the word jhana, to almost everybody that you talk about, is a stage of concentration. Mm -hmm. or, or some state of bliss and ecstasy. Yeah. And really an understanding. Not really much understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, when I started changing that, mm -hmm. I had an awful lot of resistance. No, it doesn't mean that. It means a stage of concentration, because that's what jhana is. Mm -hmm. And the insight is a separate kind of meditation. Mm. But when you start looking at the suttas and seeing how they're, when you have insight and vipassana together, mm. I mean, there must, in the Majjhima Nikaya, there must be 10 or 11 times that these are mentioned. And you go to the sutta that talks about it and you'll see it's vipassana with samatha, mm. or they, they'll say serenity, or one of those kind of words. <coughs> so, that's, I can see how easily Buddhism, when it uh, started going into other countries, how it got changed because people were already practicing their one point of concentration. And then you try to you know, just soften it down a little bit and get people to understand. But it, uh, it got to some of the people that were really, really staunch absorption persons. And uh, like a lot of the Tibetans, I'm not saying all, but I'm saying a lot of the Tibetans, they, they practice many, many different forms of absorption concentration. Mm. But when you talk to them about adding that relaxed step, mm -hmm. they, uh, that's a foreign idea to them. Yes. Yes. And they're so much into their different psychic things. I mean, as 
How many books of you Tibetan <laughs> Buddhism have you read? That <laughs> yeah, you know, if I fly through the air and I, uh, yeah, I dry the blankets. <laughs> Yeah, they're really into that, mm. and I I see that as a one-pointed kind of concentration. But there, and there's some real fantastic things that can happen through one-pointed concentration. It's just what is the end result? Mm. If you want to work to have a rainbow body, you can certainly do that, and then when you die, you got this big rainbow around you. But how how is that helpful? No, that's true. They, apparently they do it just while they're still alive. Yeah, I, I know they can, but it's the ones that still doing it when when the body has died. Yeah, that that's this the rainbow body is a, a stage towards nirvana. Yeah. <sighs> it's been pointed out by others that it's not so. Yeah. But they see it as a. Um, a well, yeah. And it is. That's real interesting. It's it's like there was some in the 1920s. There was some uh, some people that were really really good at one point in concentration, and they started pointing their mind at being able to see what was the smallest thing that they could see and they, they were the ones that by their description they were describing quarks mm. that they could see that mm. and that's truly wonderful mm. but what is the advantage of that does that lead you further along the path to liberation to being awake instead of enlightened Yeah. Opposed to one pointedness. Oh yeah. And but you can you can radiant. do it you can do it both ways. That's the thing. Yes, but the uh, oh yes, yes, yes. But um, which one more beneficial? The radiating. Well, like I said, you, I have done it both ways. And, and it's it's real powerful both ways. Mm -hmm. It's just that one leads to deeper understanding. The other one leads to a blissful state. And they're, they're both real nice. So the, the, uh, the one point one, you're not going to see or understand. You're not going to understand how mind's attention really does work. So that would be the better description for meditating than for the radio. Yeah. And they're doing studies now mm -hmm. with people that are practicing one-pointed concentration. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that there is a change in energy, that the heart space does change energy. Mm -hmm. And it affects people around. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a real good advantage. Yeah. It's a nice thing. But does it lead to you to understand how mind's attention really does work? And does it lead you to see the uh, impersonal nature of everything? That's the thing with doing the one-pointed concentration radiation because I'm doing it and I'm helping you. And it just doesn't work as, as well that way. So would that why lead to the liberation from something? No, because you're not letting go of, of craving. So it's not what it practice more. Well, <laughs> uh, they put a lot of Buddhist texts 
and try to justify it, yes. but that's the way the Asians are about things. So according to the suttas, it's a little bit off track. It's a little bit off track because they they have a tendency to put this practice is this, and this practice is this, and this practice is this. Mm -hmm. And they don't see how things are supposed to be like this. Mm -hmm. They don't see how things are intertwined. Mm -hmm. And when I first started teaching loving-kindness meditation in Malaysia, uh, boy, was there a lot of resistance to that. How dare you teach something like that, that it's not vipassana. And I started saying, well, yes, it is. It's just a different object of meditation, that's all. And then people started getting successful with it, and all of a sudden they started not criticizing so much. Yeah. So it's a it's been a long haul, but it's definitely worth it. So why don't we share some merit? <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.